So I have a humorously appropriate comment to make on the next session, uh, and that is Dr. Michael Weber is running a little late, and that's why you don't see him sitting up here, because his hybrid car broke down on the way from Austin, uh, with an electrical problem, no less. So, uh, but he's back on track, just showing you how quickly hybrids can be repaired, and uh, he, I, he'll be arriving soon. Uh, so, but it's with great pleasure that uh, I start the session and uh, introduce uh, Marx Boyar, uh, who is a partner at Baker Botts, who specializes in uh, technology um, and intellectual property law. And um, he looks at intellectual property transactions and licensing, patent analysis, patent strategy, patent prosecution, that sounds frightening, and uh, litigation. Uh, he's counseled many Fortune 500 companies and startups and individuals. Uh, so I think he brings a really unique perspective. Uh, and I, I need to give him credit where it's due. It was his idea and his colleague, Brian Deere, who was also here from Baker Botts. And again, my thanks to Baker Botts uh, for sponsoring uh, this conference uh, that really brought to my attention this whole issue of uh, the interesting role the patent pools have played in the IT world and thinking out loud about uh, what it might mean over time in the energy sector. So it's really great to have Mark share his insights with that uh, on that topic with us today. And uh, then uh, we'll have our other uh, session speakers give us some background on actual patent pools uh, and where they're going and how they see that. So it should be an interesting session. Mark, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Mark Spoliar, uh, and uh, I'm a patent attorney. I, I do I, I reside in the uh, the firm Baker Botts's Palo Alto office, uh, and I work with a lot of um, information technology companies on their patent strategy. Um, I want to give you a little bit of a, a, a background about what I intend uh, the talk to be. Um, it's mainly a, a talk about um, how you know ex basically how uh, any emerging technology, especially a lot of these alternative energy technologies, can uh, you know possibly adapt to some of the um, I guess the the intellectual property standardization and patent pool paradigms that you see in the IT space. And um, and so first, I want to get into a little bit you know about what I view a patent or what a business person should uh, how they should view a patent. A patent essentially is just a business asset that arises from all the R&D uh, you know, of, of a given concern. And uh, what I want to focus on here today is a particular model for how an industry or, and a particular company can exploit uh, you know, their patent portfolio. Uh, I mean, obviously there are, and I want to contrast that with you know, some of the more traditional models. Um, my talk here is more about how patents are used in a more open manner in connection with uh, standards and patent pools, um, as opposed to a uh, you know more proprietary model where you develop a piece of technology, you say to the world, "This is my technology. Stay away. I'm the only one who will exploit it, um, and I want to realize monopoly profits from that." The uh, you know a lot of uh, there are a lot of examples in the information technology industry of um, these main components, okay? Um, you know, in the beginning of some kind of technology, uh, you know, or you know, the next generation technologies in a mature field, uh, you know, it's typically characterized by some stage of, some initial stage of, of, a, of a proprietary, you know, closed uh, technology development environment. Um, and what you basically have are, you know, a, uh, a lot of competitors um, trying to save the so trying to solve the same problems and generating uh, you know uh, patents from their R&D you know results in a in a uh, fragmented patent landscape with uh, potentially blocking patents from uh, from a variety of different stakeholders um, a and and in standards or in areas like wireless technologies optical disk storage and a whole host of others um, eventually. Uh, there, there is some level of cooperation among these players to define interoperability standards, um, you know, to promote adoption and expand the market. Obviously, once you standardize, you're moving uh, 
towards some people's approaches uh, and technology and away from others, uh, you know, and, and obviously the standards can result in some winners and some losers, but a, uh, you know, a well-developed patent portfolio can provide a hedge um, in a lot of situations that we'll explore. Um, lastly, patent pools are uh, you know, a, a sort of a different entity that I'm going to uh, define as well, um, but in what their main purpose in this particular ecosystem is to create some kind of efficient licensing regime and organize the, uh, these potentially blocking patents um, you know, in that fragmented IP landscape. So this is just a, a, uh, a slide to briefly show some standard setting organizations, this top level, uh, this, this top level section. Um, ECMA, the Internet Engin Engineering Task Force, W3C, uh, these are just IEEE. These are certain standard setting organizations that um, have particular working groups that meet to, um, you know, define and maintain various standards. There are, there are, are, are hundreds of them, um, you know, and, and some unique to various industries. Uh, and so some of the common features are working groups that uh, are joined by uh, typically interested industry participants. Um, and one of the common features relevant to my talk are uh, the, the IP rights policies, mainly having to do with the disclosure of known patents, um, you know, while the standard is being developed. And um, for the participants who are helping shape the standard, uh, you know, licensing commitments for the essential patents uh, in their portfolio. So the patent pools. A patent pool is essentially at its core just an agreement you know between two separate entities uh, that that own uh, a, a set of patents particular to some relevant area to license them to each other and and uh, um, and and others in the industry the historical uses of patent pools have been to make inventions available to the public uh, you know to promote a technical standard um, and to essentially create more efficient licensing markets um, I'll preface it by saying that uh, patent pools uh, can exist outside of standards. Um, modern times, they are, are typically centered around standards. Uh, patent pools are not a new uh, innovation. Back in the, in the 1800s, uh, there was actually a patent pool formed around sewing machines. And in World War I, there were uh, patent pools formed around uh, technology that would allow uh, various manufacturers to uh, uh, create airplanes for, for the war effort. So the modern examples of some patent pools. Uh, MPEG-LA is, is a pool that enforces the uh, MPEG-2 and other video encoding standards. Uh, the DVD-6C and DVD-3C are two separate patent pools that uh, have pooled patents and license uh, in the in the optical disc uh, uh, technology area, and there are a whole host of others. Uh, you know, IEEE 1394 is a is a uh, is another interconnection standard for computer uh, for computer buses, and then uh, I threw in a, a last example, um, of which there are, are are many. Just the linear tape organization, the backup tape uh, storage industry has a has a consortium. Um, comprised of HP, IBM, and Quantum. So I thought it useful today to uh, show um, sort of the, the, the patent standards and patent pool development in a particular industry. Um, I've, worked, I've done some work in the optical disk um, uh, industry, and I thought this was a, a, a relatively useful example. Okay, so here's, here's a timeline showing uh, essentially uh, the, the development of the optical disc, you know, the, the, the discs that are read by lasers. And um, what I want to do is, is show how, uh, who the participants were in each of these generations and how, the, uh, how their patents were ultimately used and how the standards evolved. So just as a brief overview of the history, uh, you may recall the first optical disc that was sort of out there that was well known commercially were the very relatively large size laser discs um, that uh, that were competing with VHS and Betamax at the time. 
uh, for your movies. Uh, that, that technology or it never really took off or gained consumer acceptance for various reasons. Um, the, the, the optical discs that we all think of um, were first commercially released for, for audio CDs uh, around the, uh, the early 1980s um, and eventually migrated to um, you know, data for computers, for data storage for computers, and then recordable and, and rewritable uh, optical discs as well. The next generation was, was of course, uh, the DVDs, and now we're on to uh, the high-definition uh, DVDs. But the interesting thing about this is that um, in each case, we have from you know, the early, from the late 50s up until now and continuing, we have a variety of stakeholders who are competing uh, and devoting a, a lot of research and development to the next generation all the time. Before any of these were already released to the public, they're, they're, already, to, they're already working on the, the technology that will obsolete it. And it's interesting, I think this example provides an interesting example of how these technology companies can justify um, throwing that much R&D money at, at something that uh, is constantly being obsoleted. So here are some relevant traits of the optical disk storage industry. Uh, you know, to store information on optical disk requires, there is an, an incredible number of technical challenges that have to be overcome. Uh, the, the standards uh, to produce a, a, a CD that can be read by uh, you know, any CD player that you produce uh, you know, has to you know, specify the various sizes, the reflectivity of the media, uh, you know, various mechanical properties, um, how the data is formatted, the modulation schemes, uh, and on and on and on. These, these standards are um, 100 pages, 200 pages long. And uh, there are an incredible array of technical choices um, for each of these uh, particular solutions that they choose for a given standard. So the takeaway here is that um, as there are uh, you know, a lot of research and development and, and certain approaches to various aspects of the, of, of the uh, solution um, gain mind share, uh, you'll see that those, the, that those particular choices reside probably in, in, in the, the patent portfolios of many different players. So here's, so to begin the timeline, actually the, in, there is a, a gentleman in California named Paul Gregg who was credited with inventing the optical disc in 1958. It was actually the analog version of, of what we know today. Um, he started a company uh, that was eventually bought by MCA and that joint venture uh, they, had, they, they had a pursuit of joint venture with Philips um, for the laser disc. That, that proved to be a commercial flop um, because it really couldn't record anything. And so it was competing with Betamax and VHS, and the, the actual uh, commercial implementation of the technology was not a success. Uh, Pioneer ultimately acquired DVA, and it became one of the early uh, pure patent licensing entities. So even on inventions as far back as the you know, late 50s and, and, and the 60s, uh, those patents up until recently, they're now expiring, were uh, uh, being asserted against um, CDs uh, and, and, and DVDs and, and, and other optical disc technologies. So the first generation of the CD, um, it was a joint development between Philips and Sony. Um, like I said before, they combined some of Philips's approaches for making the CDs and, and the way you, you modulate the data signal with uh, Sony's methods for uh, error correction. It gets very technical, but these are some of the aspects that made CDs a success today because CDs get scratched. These were uh, some of the schemes that solved um, uh, the problems of, of uh, CDs getting scratched and still being able to be readable. Uh, the initial CD uh, technology was for audio. It has spawned um, all the, the data and computer readable uh, um, versions and the recordable versions, uh, similar what, to what everybody would recognize as the, uh, the DVDs as well. The standards are, are maintained by Philips, and they're in the so-called rainbow book. So each flavor of the CD standards is defined in some kind of uh, uh, specification that you can, uh, a, a license you can purchase and, uh, and, and separately from that, there are a set of patent pools also maintained by Philips 
where Philips is the licensing entity for the CD technologies. Um, and they, you can, if you're an implementer, meaning a, a somebody who is making CD readers or the optical discs themselves, uh, you can acquire a license to Philips and Sony's patents and Taiyo Yuden's and Ricoh's patents um, all in, in one fell swoop from this patent pool. So the second generation of, of optical disc technology is DVDs and essentially, obviously, the, the push is always to how much more data can we store on a given, on a given disc. Uh, DVD was to replace a CD to increase data storage capacity. At the time, there were two competing standards under development, and, and you can see the two camps. Uh, the, the other players in the computer industry, like IBM and Apple, uh, saw the, the possible um, replay of the VHS and Betamax wars and persuaded the optical disc industry to uh, merge their competing technologies and approaches into one standard. And that resulted into the, in the uh, modern DVD standard that, that you, uh, DVD standards actually, that you see today. Um, the standards uh, are, are maintained by the DVD forum and you see two different patent pools. So here we can see from, uh, you know, from this particular example with DVD, we had uh, multiple companies pursuing the next big thing in, in data storage to obsolete the CD. And they had a, a variety of different approaches to solve it and increase storage densities. And uh, ultimately, the, the other players in the industry forced abandonment of one, uh, or just forced a lot of compromises on people. But despite all that, all of these companies claim to have and, uh, and have added to these pools essential patents and derive licensing revenue from that um, you know, to this day. So obviously the third generation, just to you know, get us up to current day, um, around 2002, uh, the industry started looking at, at capacities uh, beyond what DVDs could provide uh, you know, based on the shorter wavelength laser technologies and the arising need from high definition TV. So uh, the competition again developed between uh, Blu-ray that was promoted mainly by Sony and Philips and the HD DVD uh, mainly promoted by Toshiba. Uh, around the 2005-2006 time frame, unlike DVD uh, format, uh, the industry pressure did not yield any compromises. Um, however, uh, Toshiba's approach ultimately lost in the market and in 2008 they withdrew that technology from the market and announced plans to come out with Blu-ray compatible technologies. So at present, um, Philips maintains the spe technical specifications uh, and, and any implementer of obviously the, the CDs or the equipment themselves can purchase a license to the technical specifications. Uh, currently, uh, there's, there are no patent pools. Uh, the the uh, sponsors of the, or the, the main research and development companies are still trying to figure that out. Um, and Philips has in the meantime come out with its own interim license where you can obtain a, a license mainly to its, uh, or only to its patents. So that was, so that you can see from the optical recording industry that, um, you know, the, that this is how the IT industry has solved uh, or has, has, it's one approach for the IT industry to solve uh, the, you know, a sort of a sort of business risk that you have, where you say, "I want," you know, consumers want something, and here's my approach. And um, at some point, we have to standardize, um, or else, you know, this is just not going to work, and uh, because there's going to be too much fragmentation in the market. And so the 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 standard setting, and then negotiating the patent pools and the and the and and the IP licensing rights, um, allow for at least some kind of organization that these companies who have invested all this R&D can, can leverage these assets and realize a lot of benefits in the market. So standardization and licensing generally, um, you know, like I said, many technologies require the standardization ultimately uh, for its own utility um, and market expansion. So essentially when you've got a, an emerging technology, you've got a choice. I mean, the, the industry as a whole has a choice essentially to either you know, not license and keep the technology proprietary and closed, and you're, you oftentimes are going to restrict market growth, 
Uh, the section op second option, like these pools and standards have chosen to do, is to license freely and, and benefit from the market expansion under the theory that it's better to have a uh, smaller piece of a big pie than a large piece of a small pie. So, you know, I as a practitioner, I help companies in this, in this environment. So what are some of my recommendations, uh, you know, for companies that are uh, developing technologies that, that are heading for standardization, either de facto because of consumer demand or because the industry it requires it for some kind of interoperability? Um, you know, in, in my view, the patents that you get out of your R&D can offer a hedge here. And, um, you know, my recommendations to any technology company essentially are that you have to patent your technologies aggressively in the areas likely to be subject to standardization, um, you know, to increase the chance of having relevant assets, um, you know, identify areas of past and continuing R&D uh, that would relate to possible standardization for next generation technologies. Um, also, uh, as, you know, you're, you're doing your own competitive analysis of, of competing approaches, anticipate the problems with, uh, you know, don't focus so much on, on your, your own technology to the exclusion of others, look at what other people are doing, uh, anticipate their problems, and you have, uh, you have scientists and, and, and researchers who are so skilled in this technology, they can probably figure out potential solves relevant to other approaches that one day could be a very key patent. And again, if there are standards activities um, that are uh, underway, monitor those standards activities so you can adjust your, your, uh, your IP portfolio and your strategy for that accordingly. And then uh, participation in standards bodies uh, is, is something that um, is, uh, is, is a choice that a lot of in, uh, in IT companies make um, for various reasons. And, and there I'd say that you know, the, the main thing is, is the ability to influence uh, the development of the standard. It doesn't, come at, uh, it doesn't come for free. There are certain, like I said, licensing obligations that, that come up. Um, but uh, you know, a carefully crafted strategy can yield a lot of benefits. So the, the pros and cons of patent pools here, this is more of like a general for the industry pros and cons. Um, so like, I've said, like I said, with the optical disc industry, we, we had multiple patent holders, each one with what I would call an essential patent, meaning that there is one person who can say, no one's making a CD here without my say-so. So one of the great advantages of the patent pools are just to um, have some kind of cooperative pooling mechanism where you're removing these blocking patent, uh, these you know, these, these uh, blocking patents. Um, for the implementers, those who want to use the technology, it's one-stop access. Ne negotiating technology licenses is a, is, um, that's my business, it's a slow and painful process oftentimes. If you have one-stop access and can negotiate a, 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 a license uh, in one fell swoop to all, a huge majority of the blocking patents in a technology space, that's a great thing for companies. Um, it also, you know, encourages rapid development and implementation of these standards. Um, and, and can reduce, you know, royalty stacking and, and holdout problems, like I mentioned. Some of the disadvantages, if, if not properly implemented, um, are, are that, you know, pools can have anti-competitive effects um, and, and can actually inflate the costs of licensing and protect weak patents in the, in the technology space. So obviously, one, anytime you're having a, uh, uh, you know, cooperation among uh, different industry players, the antitrust concerns come to the fore. Um, and the De Department of Justice has provided guidance, um, you know, in the areas of patent pools. So some of the concerns are, um, you know, by the DOJ uh, generally are, um, you know, pools involving patents on substitute technologies. Um, they they tend to, you know, reduce competition and, and increase prices. So if you're, so in the in the standard space, generally speaking, as long as you keep your patents to the essential ones, um, you know, it's about focused on that technology, everything's essential, they're not substitute technologies. Uh, and, you know, pools can, you know, if not, if not properly implemented, you know, reduce incentives or ability to innovate, um, where the, the pools could have overly broad grant backs, uh, meaning if you want to adopt the CD technology, you may be obligated to uh, license back uh, your improvements as well. Um, and if the pools have, uh, don't allow uh, members to independently license, you may uh, again, uh, you know, be inflating license prices, and and also pools can create the possibility for collusion. And so, uh, in creating pools, um, it's important to keep those things in, in mind. Um, so here are some considerations for uh, when industries come 
together and try to create a pool. So first of all, you have to pay very careful consideration of the Department of Justice's um, antitrust guidelines. Um, and uh, oftentimes, as was done with MPEG LA and the DVD-6 forums, um, you can actually request DOJ review of your pool structure, um, and they will uh, give you, um, you know, written reviews back about the uh, about their opinions of your pool and and uh, whether whether they they feel it, it has sufficient safeguards. So the main overarching concern is that you don't want to use pools to inflate the value of weak patents, um, and and for that reason. Uh, or narrow or, or irrelevant patents. So for that reason, these are the potential safeguards that are, that are typically employed in pools, um, limiting these pools to the essential patents um, as determined by an independent expert. There's basically a gatekeeper. So the DVD-6 forums and a lot of other ones, a company that wants a, a patent declared essential has to apply. And it's, a, it's, it's done uh, by independent experts um, and, and that keeps the pool to the essential patents. Uh, there's also a, a period because obviously patents can be asserted um, and, and declared invalid or their scope is, is judged to no longer be relevant to a given standard, so there have to be mechanisms to regularly police and remove these patents from the pool. Um, you know, typical other components are the royalty allocation schemes because obviously uh, not all patents are created equal. Um, and some will be foundational to the standard, some may not. Uh, the pools typically allocate revenues based on the relative merits of these patents. Um, the retention by pool members to uh, independently license so that, uh, so that members can, so that outside, people outside the pool can actually say, well, there are basically three of 10 patents that I'm scared about, the rest I'd be willing to challenge. I'm just gonna go to the separate uh, implementers, so I don't want to have these. So if we allow the uh, ability to independently license, you're not having the strong patents being propped up by the, or you're not having the weak patents being propped up by the strong ones. Um, and then also a willingness by the pool to license all interested parties on a you know fair and non-discriminatory basis. Um, and then limiting grant back rights, meaning the implementers have to grant back their improvements to only those uh, uh, essential patents um, you know, and, and they get compensated on the same term, on the same terms as any other uh, member of the pool. So, lastly, for businesses individually, that was more of, an, of, of, a, of a business level role. Um, you know, some of the factors to consider for, for a particular business, um, you know, when, when deciding whether to engage or enter into a pool are, you know, the relative strength of your patent portfolio. You know, if you're, and, and that can cut both ways. Um, and I'll, I'll discuss that, uh, you know, at the end sort of, I'll, I'm gonna enumerate these factors first. Um, also, um, you know, whether the company actually intends to participate in this relevant market. You know, pool participation is, is an efficient way to obtain licenses from other industry players, and it you know, also offsets the cost of, of getting these licenses. Um, and um, if you're a market player and you, you are interested in market expansion, you know, the, the pools tend to facilitate adoption of the technology and expands the market. Um, however, you know, countervailing considerations are, um, you know, you should also consider is that the, the possibilities of exacting more revenues by avoiding, you know, RAND, meaning reasonable and non-discriminatory licensing commitments, and just license independently. Um, you know, other considerations that I would, I, I would uh, um, say are, are a large factor are if your company actually participated in the standard uh, in question, you've probably already committed to some kind of RAND licensing terms, so um, you know some of that may have been decided for you. Um, so you can see, you can see from the optical disc industry, do you want to be a DiscoVision, which never participated in any of these pools? They are an independent licensing entity, or do you want to be a, um, or do you want to participate in these pools? And it seems to, uh, uh, the choice seems to go around about um, you know whether you're. You know, interested in, in, in promoting the market and, and seeing an efficient market you know, coming to play and, and intend to benefit like that. Um, you know, DiscoVision was, a, was you know, a loser in the industry. They decided to go a different route. And um, so to lastly, to conclude, this is, uh, like I said before, I just wanted to round this up, is this is just a paradigm that the IT industry has, has, um, 
has utilized very effectively in, in, a, in a number of different instances um, you know, so that uh, you know, all this R&D money uh, that is invested by a lot of competitors um, you know, is, is in some ways cooperatively, co cooperatively leveraged uh, for, the, for the good of the market. And, and um, you know, as the, the um, alternative energy technologies emerge, um, there will be certain ty types of technology categories that would be very appropriate for these types of models as well. And so with that, I'll conclude and, and, and field any questions that you, that you have. What, uh, what do you see any special set of challenges or opportunities arising from technology transfer from university research? Um, yeah, oftentimes, uh, the well, some of the challenges, and I, I think uh, some of my my following speakers are going to be able better to answer that. Is is um, I think it's it's all about you know basically you're asking you know here is a technology that's been developed. Am I going to invest in this? How am I going to be able to exploit this? And um, you know to the extent that the model that I have, uh, or to the extent that te technology lends itself to standardization. The model that I just um, sort of laid out that, that the optical disc industry follows is something that um, would provide a model for how you would realize, um, you know, or manage some of the risks about um, how the how the technology once commercialized may or may not migrate to what um, you have just purchased as far as a core technology. The value of the patent pool. Highly dependent on the will of the industry to police the pool. How do you see the energy industry in general of specific parts as a police and not specifically all exploration is not very attractive? Mm -hmm. um, actually, you raise a really good point, um, and I've seen it firsthand in the optical disc industry. The the efficiencies and the benefits of the pool, especially to the pool members, um, do require um, a lot of concerted enforcement action. Um, you know, for example, uh, in the optical disc industry, um, it, if you don't police en masse and really try to enforce uh, and, and not let players free ride, essentially, on these development standards, you're going, the market's going to adjust to that, and they're going to say, wait, you know, and it happened especially with the optical disc uh, manufacturers. So the, the, the players in the, the, the competitors in the player space, they, they, there was a lot more enforcement going on. In the optical disc space, there were, it was all about margins where they, they weren't licensed. So all the competitors in that space, when they were getting charged three cents a, a, a disc, their margins eventually, because there was so much competition that was unlicensed, their margins were so small that the royalties at three cents a, an optical disc were about uh, seven to ten times higher than the margins that the uh, unlicensed manufacturers were making on the discs. And so then the choice, once the industry matured and they didn't have this enforcement, it was a no-brainer. I will continue to infringe because I have no choice unless you uh, essentially, and I'm going to fight it every step of the way, unless you enforce these patents against me aggressively and, and pursue me in litigations. And, and in the optical disk space, that's finally happening now. But it, it, you can see that if you allow it to persist and you don't police, um, you'll see inefficiencies develop where you've given the players in the industry that are unlicensed no choice um, and you, you have to come after them um, as opposed to them coming to you first. Okay. Thanks very much, Mark. Okay, my, our next speaker is my colleague, Dr. Andrew Barron, who is the Charles W. Duncan, Jr. Welch Chair of Chemistry 
and a very well-respected professor of material science here at Rice, a highly published, uh, a highly esteemed, and uh, he has been involved in a program uh, in Texas called the Advanced Energy Consortium. Um, so one of the problems, let's say, take, choose nanotechnology. So if we take the area of nanotechnology, one of the problems we've got is the patent office. And if anyone trusts the government to do anything correctly, then you're dreaming. So the patent office is, is one of the big problems. And the issue is that nanotechnology was not one of the core areas when the US or even the, any of the European uh, patent offices were developed. And so when a patent turns up to the office in the area of nanotechnology, what they do is they have to assign it a group. And so they have to choose who within that uh, the office reviews it. Is it someone, is it computer, is it chemical, is it physics, is it engineering? And those uh, choices tend to be not necessarily random, but you can see two patents with almost identical subject matter, and one will have gone to material science and chemistry, and one will have gone to physics. And therefore the examiners in those two do not see what the other's doing, right? They don't know about the other space. The patent examiners, certainly in the US uh, office, are not PhDs. They don't tend to have the level of experience that perhaps their position should need. And so what happens is you get a lot of patents issued where you, I've actually seen two patents very closely issued, no um, uh, uh, argument between them, where the claims are almost identical and they've been issued by two examiners in two different groups claiming the same thing. Right? So in nanotechnology, this became a big problem. You've got, uh, except the board's got down sharp, you've got these number of different spaces and you get significant overlap. So let's choose one. This is from about five years ago, if you can read this. Um, this is in sort of the area of carbon nanotechnology. And let's just chart in the number of patents that claim carbon nanotubes. And about five, six years ago, it was about 10. If you look at the number that claim the methods of producing them, there was about 38. If you just want to produce them by a certain route, which gives the pure tubes, which will allow you to use them, and we're going to go down the line towards solar energy, there's about 24 of those patents. Then there's 238 patents just saying applications, and they're not even specific. Those are ones just saying an application of a nanotube because I've done something to it. By the time you get down to wanting to make a photovoltaic device, a solar cell, which contains nanotubes, you probably had to, if you really were going to be honest with yourself and the patent system, and eh, maybe license three or 400 patents, right? Clearly, this isn't going to work, right? It means, and of course, one thing you have to remember is a patent doesn't allow you to do anything. It just allows you to preclude someone else from doing it, right? Just because you've got a patent on using nanotubes to make solar cells doesn't mean you have the right to do it. So the problem is we've got this massive amount of nanotechnology patents out there, and uh, universities, we've got companies, You've got universities, uh, Rice, for example, that allows the use of some of its patents essentially gratis because they're core fundamental patents. And then you have other entities that insist on payment of essentially the same claims. So what does the user do? Do they go to Rice and say, I get to use this for free, but someone else says, oh, no, you have to pay for it, but it's the same thing. Who has the right to patrol that? So one of the problems in nanotechnology space, it's got so complicated. It's become so overlapping because of the structure of the patent office. The other issue is, in a lot of cases, some uh, uh, nanotechnology patents don't even contain nanotechnology. If you go and look up the largest, uh, just USPTO website, type in nano and find which company has the most patents containing the word nano, um, you'll find it's a cosmetic company. Go and look up their patents, 99% of them don't even actually have nanoparticles in them. They just use the word nano somewhere in there. So there's a lot of nanotechnology that isn't even nanotechnology. So one of the problems is we've got into a situation where the patent space is too broad, a lot of nano really isn't nano, and the other issue has been this reach through to future inventions. There's a group that claim, there's a company here in the United States who claim to have invented carbon nanotubes, if you read their patents, it doesn't actually say that. They weren't even discovered then. But they've been trying to sue people over this issue for quite some time. So reach through is a big problem. So where are we going to head? I think there's two different ways, uh, ways that can head. And the reason I've got this mobile and excellent logo up there is uh, several years ago, I, I've done several court cases for various different companies in electronics, chemicals, uh, health drinks, you name it. 
Um, I was hired as by a law firm here in town. Um, actually, the opposing counsel was Baker and Bot, so I have to say, uh, which was to be a, an expert witness for Mobile in a big court case. Massive great litigation. It lasted, oh, I don't know, three years. Uh, trial was about a month. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, judgment came down. In fact, the jury didn't even get to decide. The judge just suddenly decided sort of halfway through, oh, these guys win, and it's this much money. And so uh, several hundred million dollars of damages was awarded. Within two months of that judgment, that happened. ExxonMobil merged, right? So either you're going to end up with litigation cases which are totally fruitless. I always say that the only people who uh, uh, got anything out of that litigation was Baker and Botts, uh, me, um, Connolly Rose, who are the lawyers on the other side, a couple of other expert witnesses. I built a house. Um, other than that, uh, it was totally pointless. So in this nanotechnology space, you're going to have increasingly more and more cases where you're going to have litigation. And the problem is these technologies have to build on each other. You have to merge the technologies together to create a product. And one of the things that especially universities often lose sight of is that core technologies don't make money. Right? I mean, Gatorade's probably the only example. Right? Core technologies don't make money. What they do is enable technologies that enable applications, that enable products, and they make money. And so one of the issues you have to do is separate those two spaces. So one of the things that we've done here in, in Texas is a joint program between UT as the managing partner and Rice as the technical part partner is called what's called the Advanced Energy Consortium. And those of you that are in some of those companies, you can see the logos, you, you understand what it's about. The idea initially was the state of Texas wanted to develop an oil and gas version of Semtech. And the, and the idea was that the state would run it, and there was a meeting in Austin, and the companies involved kind of decided that it was better for the companies to organize this than the state to organize it. So it became a state, uh, a company-run program. Member companies brought in, ExxonMobil was originally, but they're not a member anymore. The companies were brought together. They each put in a million dollars a year. They pool that money, and they chose a specific topic of research. What actually happened, there was almost like a quiz for leaders in each company and certain areas. And it, one, the one that came up the most was downhole sensors. The ability to understand where you'd fracked, where you'd put a prop and where the oil was, where gas was, where water was, how a water flood was proceeding, all those issues in terms of downhole sensors. So that was the, the key technology area. The idea then was you've got each of these companies putting in their money. It's over a, a long period of time. You get funded grants at universities, and the technology should be accessible to all the companies, which actually, in theory, works out very well. So it means if you're Schlumberger or Halliburton, you may be a competitor on a job that BP is running, but it doesn't matter because you both get the same technology, and where you win is by your own skills within each company. So the core technologies, the university technologies, become accessible to all the companies within the patent pool, you might want to say. So the, the concept of the Advanced Energy Consortium, I think, is a very valid one. And there's several other examples that have been seen. For example, MIT has the uh, Center for the Nano Soldier, or uh, whatever it's finally called, um, which has Raytheon, DuPont, and so on. So you have systems where universities are funded in research programs uh, by multiple companies where each company gets access to the basic technology, but then gets to use it for their own special needs. Now, there are a couple of problems, and, and I will say with the AEC, there are a couple of issues. One of the problems is under the terms, the PI and their students have to sign an agreement that they understand there'll be no royalties. You're not going to get anything. Sorry, it's for free. In other words, what's called, you've, you've set the price of the, the technology prior to the invention. Now, the only reason Rice can do that where is because we have multiple companies in the AEC. Otherwise, we'd lose our tax-exempt status if we did that. So there's, there's some issues with that. An investigator has to decide whether, if this is really, really going to be good, do I actually want to take funding from the AEC? Because if I don't, and I just call up Schlumberger, I can do a deal with them, and I get royalties. But if I deal with the AEC, I don't get any royalties. The university has to waive its royalties. The other problem, and this one, by credit to my colleague over there from UT, was not his office, was a problem that UT insisted that all agreements had reach-through clauses. It meant that any invention by the inventor or the university that could ever be considered to be needed, necessary in terms of the patent pool, for a new technology 
could be got free of charge. That produces a problem. What if Rice has already licensed to DuPont? And it's getting royalties from DuPont from a process for making carbon nanotubes. Just, it doesn't, but I'm just giving an example. Right? Now, the AEC comes along. There's a use for those nanotubes for downhole sensing. But under the agreement, it gets the rights to the free use of the nanotubes. DuPont suddenly lost its income. Right? So there's a problem there. That was something that never really got resolved. And as a result, several PIs turned down the grants. And a couple of universities turned down the grants. The universities just said, we can't deal with this. So it's always a problem in having the understanding of what's fundamental research, what's applied research, what are the companies really going to use, and how are they going to use it. So I'll give a, an example, uh, sort of my uh, alternative. Um, and it, it may be a stupid idea, but it can't be any sillier than the stimulus package. So, um, you know, so <laughs> uh, it's interesting. I was listening to the stimulus package discussion of, of promoting technology, stimulating technology. I think that's the last thing it did. I know there was a, a requirement for carbon dioxide sequestration. Uh, of the 10 grants that got issued, hundreds of millions each, not one had any new technology. So clearly doesn't stimulate the technology. But let's think about how technology does develop. And I liken it to an onion. So I just call it the barren onion. So the first level is that you're a university. And, and you know, in its heyday, Bell Labs, DuPont Central Research, Exxon Central Research, probably were the same. But let's just say for the moment it's a university. The fundamental discovery, it's a composition of matter, a new type of particle, a carbon nanotube, C60, whatever that discovery is. right? And that's really just a core technology patent. Right? Um, then you can decide, oh, I could use this for something. So we have a sort of a method of making that technology. So you, how do you make C60? How do you make carbon nanotubes? Once you've learned how to make something, the question is, what do you do with it? And you can start to think about, well, maybe I should file a patent on the application of that, the use of carbon nanotubes in composites. Right? And you can keep on going through specific devices you can make. You can have methods of fabricating the devices. And eventually, you can have the use of the device. Right? So you can have a whole hierarchy of inventions of patents, whether basic science or engineering patents, or even design patents that control that technology. The problem is you've got a push and a pull. One side of it is the technology push. It's basic core technology. The other side is economic gain. And I would divide it crudely that certainly core technology, things which are composition of matter and methods of making that composition of matter, and sometimes the applications, are really the things universities develop. And they're very good at doing that. But it doesn't make the money for a company. It's background you need. If you don't have it, you're going to get sued by someone. Right? This gentleman will come and find you. Right? And he knows where you live. Right? So you need to have that background technology, but it's not really what your business is. It's the other side of the equation. It's the actual device you sell. It's the device you use to determine where the water-gas uh, interface is down a shale well. Right? It's things like that to work out porosity of, of a well. Those are the things that you actually want to protect, because that's your core business. So I came up with an issue, is that universities tend to have the stuff in the pink, and companies tend to want the stuff and protect it in the green. So however, you've got to work out what the value of that is. So I came up with a, a concept. And you have to think about what the history of the patents were. And most people think it started with the patent office. Well, it didn't. Uh, I've sort of become more transatlantic with the years. But I should pronounce patent patent. And most Americans think Brits are just weird pronouncing it that way. But the reason is, is it is because it has to be patently obvious. The idea of a patent came about as a royal charter. The crown would say to a businessman in Britain or in England, yes, you have a monopoly. You're allowed to be the only person who will sell oranges or stained glass windows anywhere in uh, the empire. Right? But in return, I'm going to give you a letter saying that, but it has to be an open letter. The open letter meaning everyone knows that you have the monopoly. And that's really where our modern system of patent comes from. You have to tell everyone what your invention is so everyone knows not to infringe it, right? Or everyone knows what it is. And in fact, the bizarre thing is the history of, of how long a patent uh, survives for actually comes back from 1449. That's when the, the concept of how long, you, for example, European patents work. When patents were formalized here in the United States, Congress came up with a, a quote and I won't read the whole thing, but the key issue is to promote the progress of science. The idea of a patent is to tell people what your invention is such that they can be cleverer and work out how to get around it. 
right? Now, they could license it from you, but really the idea is how do you promote technology? How do you get progress? And so universities have a choice. We could just give everything to everybody, right? I mean, I've done that before where, uh, you know, you're not sure about whether you want to patent something. What you do is you publish it. Everyone gets to use it for free, right? And the technology's out there. The only problem is the university can't do that wholesale because it has a fiduciary duty to its faculty and students. You can imagine the system where university gives away through the AEC technology and a graduate student 10 years later comes back and sues the university because, well, wait a minute, my, my idea when I was a grad student was worth millions. And you gave it away, you know? So somehow you've got to come up with uh, an approach that tackles both. So it's what I call the PayPal system, right? And the PayPal system is very simple. It means you get on and if you've got a university or a company that has core technology that people can use for all different applications, maybe you have different levels and you maybe have to fill out your tax uh, ID number for them. So if you're a university or a 501c3 uh, corp, you get it for free because you're only going to be doing R&D and since you're, you know, the idea of a patent is to protect from make, use or offer for sale, well, you're not selling anything but you are making and using the technology and the patent. So you're still infringing. Damages could be zero, but you're infringing. But you get a license. So if you're a researcher and someone has a core patent in that area, you just get online. OK, we'll take that. Rice will take these sets of patents from Stanford. And that means our researchers can quite happily, quite legally, go and do research. Immediately, you're promoting the use of that technology to do something smarter. Because of course, Rice faculty are much smarter than Stanford faculty, right? So we're promoting the technology. Now, if you're a small business, one of the problems is, you know, you're a startup, and I put SBIR, meaning that's my definition of a small business, one that's uh, eligible for a small business initiation re uh, initial research grant. So if you're a small business, you can't afford tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, but you could afford 500 bucks or 1,000 bucks. Choose your, choose your number. That would be preferable as a small business if you're in the space of doing uh, energy or, or water purification. And you think, well, there's this IP that Rice owns that actually we've been using that material. We don't know whether we're going to use that commercially, but we're doing it now. Eh, 500 bucks, it's worth it. That's less than the lawyer charges for an hour to decide whether or not I'm infringing or not, right? So you choose a value which is appropriate. Of course, if you're a large company, so if you're Exxon or someone else, well, maybe it's a lot more per year. You, you, you know, depending on the, the application, the technology, and so on. The idea being is that it's a tr way for a university or a small company or any, even a large company to very rapidly allow its technology to be used by lots of people for research, for development, without having to worry about litigation. Of course, I put banks last. If you're a banker, you just have to give me your 2009 bonus check, right? And that, uh, that's your, your fee for your, uh, uh, your, your use of the license. So the concept is, Level, uh, levels should be aimed to promote technology, should be enc encourage payment, a bit like the patent pool. When you've got a set, if you set your patent pool costs so high, no one gets to license. Just an example you gave with uh, the optical, uh, where your profit margins are such. But if you set it to a reasonable level, it promotes people to undergo uh, research and also discourages litigation. Um, and to prove that I'm this is a daft idea, maybe, but at least it's a workable one. I actually started several companies, and two of them uh, that I've started have agreed to do the, exactly this. And they've got key nanotechnology license, uh, patents, for example, methods of making ceramic nanoparticles. And they could be used for thousands of different applications, but they're only going to look at buoyant propens. They're not going to be looking at any other application, at least in the foreseeable future. So they're willing to just provide a blanket license, a minimum royalty, non-exclusive license to any company who wants to protect themselves from potential cease and desist letters. And another company which is in the energy space is in solar, has a whole slew of key patents which could be used for multiple different applications. Everything from data storage, uh, device memory chips and so on. Again, very simple. It's not a big burden on either company or the licensing company. So I actually think that, and I've talked with several universities about this, this concept of providing, especially for universities or core technology, a method by which people can access that technology very quickly, and what that does is promotes new invention, because that's really what we're aimed at doing, okay? 
Finally, just uh, uh, this last summer, I had to spend, uh, I was uh, Prince of Wales uh, innovator, and as part of that, I spent the whole summer going around the uh, universities within the University of Wales system and what they call their techniums, which are uh, incubator space. And one of the problems is trying to provide uh, IP programs within a university system that has traditionally not developed intellectual property and has just basically given everything away. And the problem with that is it hasn't helped support the local economy. So the idea is was to develop a protocols for the universities within Wales to understand what the value of technology was, not necessarily with the view of making lots of money with it, but with the view of assisting the local companies and local economy in protecting the products that are going to make the money for the region. Finally, uh, thank you for your attention. Be happy to answer any questions. Stun silence, that's good. Different technology in general. Different technology ha, <laughs> generating entity have different strategy and policies about letting or limiting their personnel from doing proprietary or non-proprietary research. Some will just do it open for all. Some will say, no, in our campus, everything we do is public domain. Can you comment about the different trade-offs of who does what and why and what do you think is there's a number of different issues. So uh, the first one is always a, a legislative issue, right? What, what universities are allowed to do and what they're not allowed to do. As a private school and actually as a state school, UT, for example, we can't have a company on our campus, right? They can't be a money-making entity. Now, it could be a wholly owned subsidiary of the university, right? Because, of course, the university still makes money at what it does, but it has to be within its own business, i.e. education. So we're not allowed to have companies on campus. You go to the UK, and when, even when, back when I was a graduate student, Imperial College had two companies, they're still on campus. And they're not even wholly owned subsidiaries of the university anymore. So in the UK, universities can have companies on their campus. So there's a, there's a, a legislation issue about what you can and can't do. On top of that, there's always there's additional tax problems. Because uh, this building, I think, is one of them, was built with tax-exempt bonds, you cannot do anything that's not pre-competitive research in this building. So in other words, if you fund Amy to do some research in here and you get the rights to it, you've set the price of that intellectual property. You've set it before it was invented. She's not invented it yet, but you've already agreed that it's worth whatever you're going to pay it for. Rice would lose its tax exempt status on its bonds immediately, which means if this gentleman here was an investor in those tax exempt bonds, he now pays tax on them. Right? So we have an additional problem, that, and that's just because of the way the university uh, funded building several buildings on campus. Originally, the idea was to have each only buildings that were built with tax exempt bonds would be subject to that, but then the idea was the whole campus is now subject to that. That leads all sorts of issues. Now, different universities around the country have other similar issues, whether they be because of donated uh, money from uh, foundations or whether it be from um, government or state uh, institutions. And that can severely limit universities in how they can deal with companies. It's, it's a very difficult space. One of the things we're doing at Rice, we've just opened the Houston Clean Energy Park. We're in process of starting to put together a series of buildings down there to facilitate local universities to have research space off their campuses, which would allow a company, which company are you with there? Whichever, X, company X to fund research that would, could be such that it wouldn't uh, have all these problems that you get with associated with, for example, our tax exempt bonds. So different universities, and depending which state you're in, uh, and you're going to speak for state schools more, but they have the, pretty much similar problems than uh, private schools do, but in a different way. So it, it does go from one gamut to the other. You go to some countries and you find there the universities basically just provide everything for free. There is no concept of universities holding IP. And, and in fact, even here in the US, many universities just do not have a, a tech transfer office. Go one step further to national lab? That's like dealing with the post office, right? So there, I'll give you a quick story. 
that you can license technology from the national lab. Uh, it is possible. We had, there was a startup company here in, in town that went through the Rice Alliance, and I teach a course over in, uh, which is uh, Management for Science and Engineers. And as part of that, we did a patent search on that company's, they were a sort of subject company, and it turned out Los Alamos had forgotten to license the key patents. They'd only licensed these three, and it was two others that they just happened to didn't realize that they were there. So this company actually lost its financing and went out of business because the lab didn't want to license the core technology, which of course meant the company couldn't do its business. So National Labs is, is becomes even more of a problem for, for a host of other reasons. Okay, so the next speaker doesn't know I made a joke about his car. Uh, yeah, right. So uh, uh, we're very pleased to have uh, Michael Weber, and he doesn't look worse for the wear, at least it was a nice driving day, uh, who is the Associate Director of the Center for International Energy and Environmental Policy uh, at the Jackson School of Geosciences at UT, and co-director of the Clean Energy Incubator at the Austin Technology Incubator, uh, he's an assistant professor in mechanical engineering at UT and also a fellow at the Strauss Center. Uh, widely recognized uh, uh, as uh, next, for example, as a next generation fellow at the American Assembly in 2006 and a host of other prizes. Uh, let me welcome, please, Michael Weber. And if it's okay, can I sit while I talk? So I sure. have my nose in front of me? Okay, good. I'm glad I'm here. I wasn't sure I was going to make it for a while, so I'm really pleased to be here. I drive a hybrid. I won't tell you which one because I don't want to give you a bad impression of it, but this is a very advanced technology, fuel-efficient, clean car, and the motor kept overheating. And I know what to do when the engine overheats. You add coolant to make sure the radiator works, but I don't know what to do when the motor overheats. It just says, motor overheating, stop. And because it's an elect electronically controlled car, it shuts off the engine and the motor, and you have to pull over. So it's not like you could override it in the good old days with the 1966 Mustang, which I used to own with my wife. So I pulled over frequently, and I got a nice view of the, the on-ramps and things like that, but I made it here, I'm very pleased. Uh, my, I've had better uh, routes to Rice before. This is one of the rougher ones. I got my PhD in mechanical engineering at Stanford about a decade ago, and after five years of research, my very final project was actually here at Rice. I got to work with Frank Tittle and Bob Curl. These might be professors whose names you recognize for a couple of weeks project that we did at NASA. And that was much easier to get here then, it turns out. So we've come a long way, I guess. It's good to see some friends in the audience. I see some faces I recognize. So it's good to see you guys here. The, uh, the, I'm going to talk a little about smart grid and energy and try to tie it into uh, to things we care about, the intellectual property. As an engineer, I... I, I'm really proud of our grid. Our grid is amazing, our electric grid, and, and all the things that make up the grid, the power plants, and the meters, and the people, and the appliances, everything that makes the grid work really makes you proud because this is the world's biggest, most sophisticated, most amazing machine. And it has enabled great prosperity, and comfort, and health, and it's just great, the grid. So I'm very proud of that. But at the same time, I'm very ashamed of the grid because this grid really hasn't changed much in 100 years. The people who, br who brought the, brid, the grid to fruition, Edison, Westinghouse, and Tesla, names you'll recognize, would recognize it today as basically the same as what they had invented. And so we haven't made much progress, we engineers or whoever is responsible for this. this uh, the grid today, as amazing as it is, it spans a continent, can fail because of a squirrel. And so that's not very promising. Although the squirrel often pays the ultimate price for this, I guess. The electricity flows one way from the utility to the customer, and the information flows one way from the customer to the utility. So this is sort of old. There's a lack of information. Consum consumers are operating pretty blind on what's going on. So you use electricity, and then 45 days after your use, you'll get some bill, which is hard to connect to that actual particular event or that use. And the prices are frozen. We haven't changed the rates for electricity in Austin since 1994. And uh, I bet many of you will realize that prices for energy and other things in society have changed in those 16 years since then. And the idea that prices should be frozen over decades is kind of preposterous in any market-driven system. Or the idea that electricity should be the same price at a, on an afternoon at 4 o'clock in August in Texas, the same price as at 2 a.m. in March when the supply and demand of energy is very different. So we have these old ideas that drive the grid. 
And there are many examples. I was in England a couple of years ago, and I was at an old country farmhouse built in the 1700s, and the, the new addition to the farmhouse was in 1865, which I thought was interesting. And then in the 1980s, they added a dishwasher, which I thought was great. So I'm doing dishes because the host had made dinner, and I put the dishes in the dishwasher, and I hit start. And the owner of the house starts to yell at me, like, you're some sort of energy expert, and you hit start? No, 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 you have to hit the delay. It needs to run at 2 a.m. when prices are cheaper because the prices are much cheaper in England at night. So I thought this is funny that socialist England plays the capitalistic market price system much better than we capitalists in America. But that's sort of a sign. He, he sort of excused it, saying, well, you know, you're just a dumb American. Your prices are the same all the time. I realize you don't know what you're doing. Your prices are too cheap anyway. So we have these old ideas driving the grid, and there's an opportunity there to remake it. And so basically what we're talking about today with the smart grid is a revolution in the grid. We're going to remake it. We, meaning the collective we, I think, although I hope engineers play a role. It's not really clear what the smart grid means because everyone's definition is slightly different. We all sort of project onto the smart grid whatever we want out of it, I guess. But there are a couple things that I expect will be a part of it. One is two-way flows of information. So the consumer will have information about their use, not just the utility having information about their use. So I think that's a good, good news, two-way flows of information. And also two-way flows of energy. Instead of going from the utility to the home, it might go from the home to the utility or from your home to the neighbor's home or from the home to the car or whatever, or back and forth. So we'll have two-way flows of energy and information, and this invites all sorts of disasters and good news and opportunities. This means smart meters. A lot of people think that's all you need to have a smart grid is smart meters, but smart meters isn't enough. You actually need smart power plants and smart appliances because you're not always home to turn off the hot water heater. You want a smart hot water heater that turns off automatically when the prices hit a certain threshold or your pool pump or whatever it is. There are a lot of appliances we run 24 hours a day, even though we only need them an hour a day. So you need smart appliances that connect with these smart meters and the power plants. And then you need smart consumers. American consumers don't know much, as I just evidenced about myself going to England. We need to change our behaviors, which will help. We can do it when we have smart appliances and smart meters, but it really works when we get smart markets where the price has changed based on supply and demand or other sort of societal priorities. Then we need smart policies. Right now, in many places, it's against the law to put solar on your roof because the neighborhood association has declared it's ugly but you're allowed to have green grass or required of green grass that you have to spend 100 gallons of water per day to water. And then you have to pay someone money with gasoline to cut down so that you can throw more water on it to grow it again so they'll cut it down. So there are funny rules we have and policies that hopefully as we go to Smart Grid will get revamped along with everything else. So that's just the context for something I want to tell you about going on in Austin called the Pecan Street Project. Pecan Street is a historic name for 6th Street. A lot of you know 6th Street for the live music. And I can tell with this audience, you're down there going to hear live music every Friday night in Austin. So uh, anyway, 6th Street is Pecan Street. We have the Pecan Street Project in Austin. It's a public-private consortium. You heard a little bit about AEC, another consortium. Public-private consortia are something that Austin's proud of and likes to do. It's called the Austin model. I don't know if it's really the Austin model, but we like to say we invented it. And Semitex usually held up as an example of a successful public-private consortium where companies came together, as you heard, to overcome intellectual barriers that are shared. And we're trying to do the same thing with electricity in Austin. It is founded around a, a group of people at the University of Texas and Austin Energy. Austin Energy is a municipally owned utility. It's ours. We own it. Not we UT, but we the people of Austin. We are customers of it, and we're basically shareholders because it does what we want. It responds to city council. So this is a utility that responds to political will and popular will. And the popular will for green energy and innovation and electricity is quite high in Austin. So we have the ability to experiment with our own utility. So they and the University of Texas and the incubator where I work, which is designed to incubate companies and help get intellectual property out of the labs and out of the university, is a founding member. And the Chamber of Commerce and Environmental Defense Fund are too. So you've got this coalition of people with competing interests coming together to think about what it takes to reinvent the grid. And we sat down in early 2008 at a whiteboard to think, well, if we could remake our relationship with energy in Austin, how would we do it? It was sort of a gee whiz session at the, white, at the whiteboard. And then we met again a couple of weeks later, five of us, seven of us. And then we met again. We said, hey, that's pretty good. Let's get some industrial partners, so people like Oracle and IBM and Cisco and another 11 companies you'd recognize from the IT and software world who joined on. And we spent 18 months with a lot of volunteer sessions. Eventually, we had 100 volunteers working on this, dedicating time. And I don't know how many of you have been a part of these volunteer sessions to come up with a new philosophy or something. These are usually a waste of time, right? They're navel-gazing. We sit around and we come up with a mission statement and visions and objectives, and then, like, nothing ever happens. Have you ever been a part of something that never happens? 
Anyway, I've been a part of that many times. And at first I thought, oh no, this is another one of those, if we could remake the world, what would we do kind of sessions. But we stuck with it over 18 months, and then we found out, actually, we've got some pretty good partners here. We've got the right stakeholders at the table, and we've got the political will and the, and the, the perhaps the technical capabilities and the policies and things like that. Maybe we can do this, because the city of Austin policymakers got involved. And we uh, decided to form a 501c3. And so now there's a 501c3, the concrete project, a nonprofit. And we thought, well, 501c3 should have a website. Now it's got a website. And a 501c3 is a good vehicle, it turns out, to write proposals. If you write a proposal with 11 industrial partners with one of the partners as a lead, that's very complicated. If you write an 11 partner proposal with the university as a lead, you heard about this, you have all sorts of complications. But if you write a proposal with many partners with a nonprofit as a lead, it's much simpler. So we wrote a proposal in August to do a smart grid demonstration project, and in December it was awarded, 10.4 million from the Department of Energy, to do a real smart grid demonstration in Austin on the ground. The money should arrive next month. So th this is sort of amazing that we made this work. The goal here is to create a smart grid in Austin, and this is tricky because the utility is a part of it. And if you do the smart grid properly, you reduce the revenues for the utility. And so there's a business incentive by utility not to do this. But because it's municipally owned, they can do things that wouldn't make normal business sense. And so one of our first priorities actually is to reinvent the business model. The old business model for utility is spend a billion dollars on a power plant and then charge everyone for it for 30 years. People think that utilities really sell electricity. What they don't is they sell rate of return on power plants they built. That's often the way it works out. Anyway, so part of the incentives are 300 megawatts of new solar and 700 megawatts of avoided peak demand. So huge conservation targets built into this. How can we use a smart grid to do it? The goal with this 10.4 million from the Department of Energy, with the partners I mentioned, is to do a five-year demonstration project at the old airport, the Miller Airport. I don't know if you remember in the 1990s all the BRAC fights, the base realignment committees, the, fight, the fights to shut down some Air Force bases. And a lot of cities would get their Congress people to represent them saying, you can't take away our Air Force base. It's critical to our economy. Austin was one of the few cities that said, it's fine, take it. We need the airport. Austin needed a bigger airport. And by getting rid of Bergstrom Air Force Base and making it municipal, we could have a bigger airport. So we, we said, fine, go for it. And then we have this old airport now, close to downtown, that we need to do something with. Thousands of acres, hundreds of acres. So we thought, well, let's make it mixed-use retail. We'll do some big box stores, some local chains, a lot of homes, green homes, low-income housing, parks, schools, like that. So there's a redevelopment going on close to downtown with thousands of homes eventually that we're going to use as a demonstration site for Smart Grid Project because we have a controlled experiment, essentially. And what's fascinating is because it was an airport, it has its own substation. And it's very important for utility to have its own substation because then you can monitor all the data for what's going on on the other side of that substation. So we have a test environment that we can control with homes being built, all green homes already, green homes. A thousand built already, another thousand built in the next couple of years, thousands eventually. So we have an opportunity for lots of data analysis to really figure out how to do this because no one really knows if the smart grid is actually going to be better. I mean, I think there's a hypothesis that it should be better and we expect it would be, but we don't know for sure. So there's going to be 1,000 homes being built, and we've got an opportunity to wire them up with smart meters and smart appliances and smart people and solar panels and all that kind of thing, and we're going to build one model home from scratch. And this is tricky because we've got, we got architects on board as a part of our team, green architects. And one challenge with building a green home is if you build a green home today, chances are it's a green home according to 2010 standards for what a green home is. Those standards were written in 2005, and they're about 15 years behind Europe's. So if you build a green home today, it's about 15, 20 years behind what an actual green home is in other parts of the world. And so we're concerned about making this a green home that's still valid, say, a decade from now, not, not backwards looking. So we want to build a home. And then I want to do these experiments. We want to do these experiments where we see, will people actually change their behavior? You take 1,000 homes, you have 200 homes that are no different than before, 200 homes with a smart meter, 200 homes with a smart water meter. Water is a big part of this, by the way. If you think of how much energy is embedded in water, it's, it's huge. So if we can change water behavior, we save energy. So we'll have 200 homes with smart water meter, then 200 homes with both. And then we can do some behavioral studies. Do people change, or do they only change when they have price signals? Do they change by having more information? With my hybrid that I drive, I've got a little fuel economy gauge. I change my behavior just because I have the gauge, or at least I used to. And now I kind of disregard it. And that's, that's actually what people find, is having more information changes your behavior for a while. Consumption will drop 15%, but then it comes back up. It still doesn't go all the way back up. You might have a 5% drop over time. But what if that additional information was coupled with higher prices that correspond to particular times of day or behaviors? Then behavior might change a lot. That's something we want to test because a lot of the experiments on these behavioral responses have not been well designed. They don't always have controls. Sometimes they're too self-selected, the participants. So we have this opportunity to get some real data on the ground. We have opportunities for new IP because there are a lot of things we don't know how to do. We need new meters. We need new software, new appliances. 
We need new gadgets and gizmos, new building materials, new glazing on windows, you name it. And all of this is affecting the electric industry, which is a multi-hundred billion dollar industry. This is a big one. It's bigger than food. It's bigger than clothes. It's bigger than construction. So this is a big industry. And we're going to combine that with IT, which is another big industry. So we've got two big industries that might get merged or turned over in some way. And so the opportunities for intellectual property are huge. One of the things that surprised me is getting close to this through Austin Energy. I'm, I'm actually on the Electric Utility Commission in Austin, so I'm one of the overseers of Austin Energy. I'm a regulator of sorts and a non-binding regulator. I've got to vote, but it doesn't mean anything. It's sort of like at home with my wife. I've got to vote. It's, it doesn't count. I mean, it's 49%. She gets 51%. I do get to participate in these discussions. Actually, we have these fights where um, she's an architect and artist, so when it comes to anything in the house, she's the boss. And sometimes we'll talk about this together, but she usually kicks me off the design team because I think like an engineer. Also, I think white walls, white floors, all that stuff, and she wants color. But every once in a while, she'll bring me back on the design team for one question and then kick me back off. Anyway, so I'm on the Electric Utility Commission, and I've got these votes on uh, what we do with smart grids, and I participate in these discussions. And it turns out, billing's quite hard. It's really hard to deal with all that information. So in the old days, to issue a bill, you get two data points. What was the meter reading on the first day of the month and what to read at the end of the month? Now we're talking about a new data point every 15 minutes, every hour, every day. So we're talking about 3,000 data points a month. And some people talk about billing every four seconds or something. There's millions of data points. So all of a sudden, we're going to go from two data points a month to 3,000 per month. And I don't know who's going to write the software to build that. That's one of the challenges. So in Austin, we spent $50 million, roughly, putting smart meters on every, every single home. Every single home has a smart meter. We can argue about what smart really means. But it's a new meter, not the old spinning dial one, but a, a smart one that can speak to the utility, at least. And then it turns out we need to spend just as much on the software to do the billing because the old software just couldn't handle like Excel spreadsheets or whatever it was. So we uh, signed up a vendor to spend $50 million on software, and then the vendor went out of business. So then we signed up another vendor, which I think is IBM together, Oracle, like a big name. So this is one of the issues that it's when it's something new and your utility is spending tens of millions, you want a trusted name if you can, but you also have these problems that you need a solution for. Then you have some resistance as well. The utility, for all its uh, forward thinking in Austin, really wants to reinvent itself, reinvent the business model, do things that are green and clean and renewable, resilient, sustainable. But it also has a mandate to make money for the city, which is a challenge, but also has its own demands to keep things reliable. At the Dell Children's Hospital, which is a part of this middle redevelopment, they have a small power plant there. So it's self-reliant on power the most advanced natural gas technology, combined heating and power, super clean, super efficient, double redundant, it's got IT and sensors and automatic fail-safe backup systems. This thing fails all the time. It is the least reliable of all of Austin's power plants despite having the latest, greatest stuff. And one of the things they found is when the power plant trips a little bit, the software can't keep up and doesn't kick in the backup. I think they were running on a Microsoft Windows platform or something. So this is, there was some IT problem where the IT actually couldn't keep up with the power plant. And this ugly, dirty, old school coal power plant keeps on running. And this is a problem for the utility because they really want this to be on. They don't want the hospital losing power. They have diesel backup now. They, well, at least the diesel works. It's dirty, but we can turn it on. So these kind of experiences with really new technology freak people out a little bit because they've got two ethics of the utility. One is uptime. 99.99 uptime. They do not want these things to go down. And their reliability is much better than it was a decade ago, which was better than the previous nine decades. So there's an ethic to keep things working. There's another ethic to keep things cheap. In anything that invites the risk that prices might go up or that reliability might go down really makes the actual operators very nervous. No matter how, how philosophical the pronouncements are from the leader of the utility, the guys who run the stuff, they want it on. And so this invites huge opportunities for new technologies, new disruptions, new, new things that can help manage these risks so that we get the sustained power we want, but with all these other advantages. So I think those are just sort of background comments. I'll, I'll stop there. I just want to give you a sense of what's going on in Austin. We wrapped in this consortium the idea that innovation should occur and commercialization should occur, so the incubators are part of this. How do we get these technologies invented, tested, verified? use Austin as a field lab, and then launch these into companies that will create wealth and, and proliferate the ideas. And we have all sorts of IP barriers. I guess I could rattle on about it. Maybe I'll just wait for questions. So that's the context from Austin. Thank you.
Uh, Michael, could you uh, speak to the issue of uh, security concerns over hacking into the uh, control systems on the grid? This, okay, this is a great question. I should have commented anyway. What about cybersecurity? So we used to worry about security of the grid from snakes and squirrels and tree branches, and then maybe a terrorist putting a bomb at a substation or at some of these interconnects. The grid is, for all its power, it is fragile in places. And now we're moving to introduce all this software and automation to introduce a digital fragility, and it might. I think that's one of the real concerns. Just had a conversation with the chair of the PUC a couple of nights ago in Texas, Barry Smitherman. He says, we think about this all the time. And one of the challenges, it's not always clear who's in charge of dealing with this. Who's in charge of cybersecurity in Texas for grids or any other state? And there might be several people in charge. And in Austin, municipal utility, probably Austin is, and the PUC and ERCOT. And there's definitely hacker attacks that occur all the time. Sounds like there's a lot of attempts anyway. A lot of them come from China. This is a, a sensitive international issue when the cyber attacks come from one country. And we're already sort of dealing with the country on other cyber issues. Google's made big pronouncements along these lines. This is a, a problem because you don't want everything to be physically operating, but somehow you don't get power anyway because someone got into the software. And as much as I believe in IT and software and things over the last four decades, my paper records from the 1970s from third grade are still in better condition than my digital records from six years ago. So I, I have these concerns as well. I think this is, what it ends up happening is this is a solvable problem, but it's a budget item most people hadn't considered when they say, yes, let's do smart grid, smart meters. And then they put up the meters and, oh, wait, we need to do billing. And then, like, oh, wait, now we've got a whole new cybersecurity problem. When you used to go out and have the meter reader physically look at the meter, his security problem was the dog, and that's manageable. But now they're doing automated readings, and they might be readings that are much more frequent. People can get into the system and manipulate some out. Huge risk, huge concern, very solvable. I think that utilities and the PUCs and the ISOs, all these people, all these operators are on it and worried about it, but I don't think there's a clear solution yet, but it strikes me as entirely a solvable problem. So I, I have a question for you. Uh, people talk about different models, so the household models. So one model is smart appliances, right? So my appliance is going to turn itself on, so I'm not going to be involved, right? My thermostat's going to go down automatically because I'm going to program it to do that or so forth. Uh, and the other thing you hear people talk about from the commercial companies is zone pricing. So it's going to work more like my cell phone, right? Because I, I can't, I'm not going to sit around updating myself every 15 minutes about my appliances or what I'm going to push the button. So, uh, you know, cheaper at this time or more expensive at that time. Could you comment a little bit about the different yeah. options? I mean, there, there's many different ways to do pricing. That's a great question. A lot of people are immune to prices and don't care. So maybe you and I are, we're too busy. Right, let's just, I want the house cool. I'll pay the extra 30 bucks a month. And so our bill might be 150 bucks a month instead of 120, and maybe we don't care. But there is a broad swath of people for whom that $30 is a big difference. And so what you find is with, you, with these prices, they call it inverted block pricing, where you know, there's a certain amount of energy you can use at a cheap rate, and above that certain amount you need to thrive. Everything else is considered luxurious. The prices get more, more steep. That doesn't happen in Austin, by the way, but some cities or municipalities have that. And once you have the inverted block pricing, some people say, eh, I don't care. So it's, I'm, I don't want to take the time to change it. But for a lot of people, they care a lot. They, it changes behaviors for you know, half of the users. So this kind of pricing can be very effective. Uh, not for the whole population, but people are sensitive to it. It will change behavior, yet still have enough to get their heating and cooling they need so they don't die from heat waves, that kind of thing. So that's one thing you could do, inverted block pricing, where right now, price either stays the same no matter how much you use or even gets cheaper sometimes. So you have an incentive to use more. And we see the same thing in water, by the way. Water is very cheap, and the more you use, the cheaper it gets. So we could go to inverted block pricing for other resources. So you can go to novel pricing structures. Then maybe you don't have interest in getting the appliances and stuff, but it might be in the future, whether you meant to or not, the appliance you bought was smart. So this might take a decade or two to roll out. So your, your dishwasher, you could you know, I have the capability, whether you meant to or not, where it runs at a slightly different temperature if prices are above a certain thing, or your hot water heater automatically knows this. Hot water heating is a big one of these. So you, it might happen whether you paid attention to it or not. Just as your refrigerator today is more efficient than 20 years ago, you didn't mean for it to be more efficient. It is by law. So there's some of that. Then there's another piece of this, which is it might not be you controlling it. It might be the utility. So in Austin, we have the utility gives out you free programmable thermostats, which I don't know how to program, but my 10-year-old daughter can program it, but I just set it at whatever temperature I want and leave it. But not only is it programmable, which presumably can save me money if I program it, which I don't, 
but they can control it remotely and during a peak time when they've got load problems, they can dial it off for 15 minutes an hour. That's a part of the agreement. So part of the smart appliance isn't just that it makes me smarter, it actually gives the utility better capability to keep the grid stable. And if you look at the 80,000 smart thermostats across Austin, this ends up being a pretty significant load they can shave for a few minutes at a time. And if it's off for 15 minutes over the hour, the, the consumers don't even know. Then they start to do experiments where they have to train people that uh, even when they don't need the air conditioner to be off, they'll turn it off just to get people used to this habit, uh, this kind of thing. That, f that makes people nervous about Big Brother manipulating appliances. And so the appliance is partly for you, whether you meant it to or not or wanted it. It's partly for people who are very sensitive to price, which might be us, might not be. And it's partly for the utility and grid operators to have one more lever at the disposal to keep everything in balance. But it's true, uh, the meter's not enough, appliance is enough. Appliance with meters with prices, all of a sudden you've got a powerful combination. Okay, well everybody's earned their coffee break. So, uh, so we're going to come back, we're going to have a slightly abbreviated coffee break because we're a little off schedule, but not too bad. Uh, and then we'll come back for our last session on disruptive technology.